All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of MBS Seller Real Talk. You mean AMZ stuff. Seller Real Talk? Yeah, that's what I said, right? You said MBS Seller Real Talk. <laughs> I love that it's real talk because we're not going to cut that. Yep. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, you know, if anyone's been through this experience with us, this journey with us, um, usually his uh, better half is sitting with us, Jade. But um, again, you know, a little bit of baby things going on. So we had to downgrade for this. We one. unfortunately <laughs> are joined <laughs> with. Well, depending on how you know him, he's either Justin or Damon or or John. I I'm you go Bob. by many. I've names. been called Bob before. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, no. Obviously, he doesn't go by John or Bob. But um, we are also joined by, you know, a longtime friend of Managed by Stats, and that is um, Kirsty and Isaac uh, from with uh, Real Coaching. Coaching. <laughs> Coaching. <laughs> <laughs> I called it Real Consulting like three times earlier today. Um, and yeah, they we you know we did a we were on their podcast a couple weeks ago now, maybe even a month ago. And um, they've, you know, known Philip, the founder of Managed by Stats, forever and a half. And they're really good friends. They're also um, just a wealth of information when it comes to coaching, specifically, obviously, for Amazon sellers. But um, they'll help you with a lot more than just, you know, listings and basics of your, your sales process, but your whole company structure. So we were, we thought it'd be a good idea to have them on the show and really pick their brains. And um, because we already know that a lot of sellers don't know what they're doing and they could use the help. And um, we figure, hey, we'll we'll give you an in, the inside skinny and along the way, give you some really cool tips. And so a lot, of, a lot of sellers think they know what they're doing, but their data is old. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanna hear a little bit about you guys, your background. So whoever wants to kick it off. Whoever says I first. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm usually the gobby one, so I'll, uh, I'll go for that's and gobby in English, English, English. It means well, my grandparents are English, so yeah. I know I know what you're saying. My grandmother's Welsh. Oh, oh, nice one, boyo. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> that's my Welsh accent. So yeah, um, I yeah, my name's Kirsty, and as you said, yeah, I've known Philip. I think right back from the ASM one days, you know, and we've kind of all started to hang out together at the conferences and stuff. Um, and I've been selling on Amazon since ASM one, which was, I think it was back in 2013. Wow. And before that I was actually in marketing. So my kind of background is corporate marketing, corporate branding. Um, I did it for 20 odd years, um, originally from England, as you can probably tell. And then I moved to Australia, um, because I just love to travel. And also it's very sunny there. Whereas in England, it's, you know, rains a lot, a bit chilly. Um, so that's why I ended up moving to Australia, but I, I kind of got to a point where, um, I loved the kind of background in terms of marketing itself. Right. So I think, um, Curtis, you've been in from marketing background yeah. as well. So I love the insights. I love the consumer. I love really getting into the head of the customer. Um, but as you go further up the ladder in terms of a corporate role, basically you don't get to do all that cool stuff anymore, right? You just manage, manage the people, people that do all the cool stuff yeah. <laughs> and then you're kind of sandwiched in between them who are usually awesome. Um, and then the people above you who are kind of sandwiched between other people that are basically running the joint and are kind of, you know, pushing down sales targets and profit targets that don't make any sense. So I just kind of got to this point where I was like, I've got all these awesome ideas about why, how these businesses should, you know, make money, but I don't have the authority or the, um, uh, yeah, I suppose the authority to yeah. be able to make that happen. So, um, I also, I just remember being in a board meeting one day, being thoroughly bored and just kind of going, I just cannot do this for another 20 years. Like it just, I just, you know, my soul is being destroyed. So um, I just started to look for different ways of being able to make an income. I tried lots of different things, you know, real estate. I tried um, share trading. Uh, I tried eBay. Um, and I also tried websites. But the problem was that, essentially it didn't really give me what I wanted. Yes, I could probably earn money from it, but really what I wanted was freedom when it comes down to it, right? So if I had a kind of real soul searching moment to go, well, what? I'm not really that bothered about the money. I just need the money to be able to live the lifestyle that I want. And that's when I kind of like fell into Amazon because it kind of ticked all the boxes, right? You can do it from anywhere. Amazon do all the cool stuff. You basically have to get really good at one or two key things to be able to make the business work. So 
because I'd done all those other things, I spent shed loads of money. Like I think I spent over seventy thousand dollars on courses, right. <laughs> like different Jeez. different ways of doing stuff. Um, but because I'd kind of gone through all that learning of what didn't work, I knew what was going to work, and so I actually um, organized a redundancy or a severance from my job, my career. Mm-hmm. I worked with my HR director at the time and I told her what I wanted to do. And she was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah, all right, let's make this happen. So I ended up walking away with like a year's pay. And I was like, right, okay, bugger it. I'm just going to go to, I'm going to live the lifestyle now. I didn't have the business then. I just bought ASM. I thought, yeah, I think it's going to work. So I left Australia. I went to Bali for three months and I said, okay, I'm not going to come back until I've made $6,000 a month. That was kind of like my benchmark. I don't know why Mm. six. (laughs) I was like, okay, that's my benchmark. (laughs) And so I did that. I launched a product and um, I I did that in the first two months. So then I was like, okay, this is going to work. Brilliant. I went back to Australia and I kind of like just went on from there really. And um, the reason I kind of ended up coaching people was because I started to live the lifestyle that I wanted. You know, I just started to kind of post stuff on Facebook. I was traveling everywhere. I wasn't telling anyone really what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And then people were like, oh, what are you doing? Uh, you really, you're not working then. You didn't go back to GlaxoSmithKline. I was like, nope. Um, and so they started to reach out more and more about, you know, the business model and how it works and meeting people at conferences and, you know, having met Isaac and obviously he's going to talk to you about his story in a minute. Um we both had the same philosophy and we really found that there was a lot of people that, yeah, they started the business, but they didn't actually really know how to get the money out of the business, which is one of the core things. Right. And I'm sure we're going to chat to you about this today. So that's how I ended up um, coaching and working with Isaac um, in real coaching. Well then very important question. Did you like UK or Australia more? (laughs) Sorry, say that again. Did you like UK or Australia more? Oh, definitely Australia. I mean, look, <laughs> the UK is my ho- is my heart, my home, yeah. and my family still live there. Um, but yeah, duh. <laughs> but now, I mean, now I, I actually moved to um, Canada because I actually oh, so met you my went to now even colder. Good. Yeah, it's even colder. Yeah, yeah. so it's a bit weird. But <laughs> I uh, met my now husband. Um, actually, Isaac and I were doing workshops, mm-hmm. and um, he was one of our students, clients, whatever you want to call them. And uh, yeah, that's how we met. And then he's French Canadian. So then I had to move to Canada because mm. he's got two kids that I uh, ended up not adopting, but, you know, obviously <laughs> being with him. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Worry, so it's I not mean... like one of them teacher student relations, like high school or anything <laughs> like that. <He's> like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he's younger than me, but not that much. <laughs> yeah. Nice I'm Canadian. There. So no. Yeah. No, no, no. Definitely. Right. <laughs> I'm Canadian. So I know yeah. how cold it is up there. And that's brutal. It can get brutal depending on where you live in. But yeah, yeah. I, I've I'm, I've slowly I've been here for four years and I'm just adapting now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm adapting mm-hmm. to the kind of cold colder lifestyle. But at least you get a summer. So at least yeah. in England you might get a week, and if yep. you're lucky. So yeah, I can cope with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the cold. So I moved from California to Florida. Yeah, yeah. It gets very cold here. Very logical. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. whatever. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that's why they have all the golf tournaments in the winter in Florida yeah, and Hawaii. Yeah. It's freezing. Yeah. Yeah, so and it's the like golf balls are denser, and so they fly farther. Yeah, that's and, you know right. that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, thing. Yeah, because yeah. 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 it's yeah. like it's seventy-two degrees in the coldest part of our winter. So right. there you go. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Well, cool. So yeah. So obviously, I guess that brings me up. Which mm-hmm. uh, my name is Isaac uh, Kuhlman. I now live in Las Vegas. I actually grew up in the Midwest, Montana, North Dakota. Stayed some a bit. I went to college and lived in Oregon for about 12 oh, years of my life as well. Too. So I was there. Um, but I didn't get into the Amazon business. Actually, it was around the same time, about 2013. Um, I didn't start doing it on my own, actually. I actually was working in an indoor go-kart facility. And I happened fun. to run into a person who was an Amazon seller. We became friends. I was actually showing him how to be- become a better uh, go-kart racer, <laughs> which he was obsessed with at the time. So I was like, hey, here's what you got to do. So I was instructing him on how to do that. And uh, he started to see that, like, when we started to talk, I was, you know, talking about the business that we were doing at at the go-kart facility and stuff like that, and how I was improving it and actually making a profit, which it never had made profit before I was there. I was the operations manager at the time. And uh, he basically was like, well, you should come work for me. I was like, I don't know what you do. So he was like, well, (laughs) let's go to my office, which was his house. And 
I'll show you kind of what, what my, my business looks like. And I was like, okay, so look at it. Um, and then kind of figured it out a little bit. I wasn't really like too savvy on the Amazon part. I knew how to do online stuff. I'd been around like Facebook and, and, and knew about eBay and knew about Amazon, but never mm -hmm. started selling on it. Didn't know the, the ranking strategies or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, didn't really understand how you even got to be in front of customers. Cause at the time, even ads were kind of a very minimally used thing. So it was like, you just had to know how to rank pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of got on working with him. Um, he basically said, I, you know, we're going to set up an office. We'll actually do this. We'll hire some people and you're going to run the office and run that run the brands. I was like, okay, cool. So literally the day before I was supposed to start working with him, uh, his account got shut down his and the other two people's oh, wow. brands that I was supposed to work with all got shut down. That's hard to and do this in those was, days. This and was Jason Katzenbach. I wasn't working on Jason Katzenbach's account, but his account got shut down. Matt Clark's account got shut down. And then his, who's Paul Sinclair, he also got shut down as well. Oh, wow. And I was supposed to be working on three brands between Matt and Paul. Hmm. And I was like, and those, those accounts essentially were about over, well, they were over half a million a month. Hmm. That was about 300 and 300. And uh, so, yeah, they were all shut down. And I was like, oh, awesome. I just quit my job. And now I've got nothing <laughs> to do because the account shut down. Cause now it's like, there's no money coming in. So yeah. I was like, well, that was a big mistake. Anyway, we got to the office the next day and he's like, all right, we just got to get everything removed and we got to start new accounts and we got to figure this all out because this is, this wasn't supposed to happen. Wow. In reality, they were, they're doing something that has now been proven that you can't do, which is incentivize for reviews. So here's a free bottle for a review and you can't do that. Um, and that's actually been something that's even been uh, in a recent court case. So that's pretty much guaranteed. If you try to do that, incentivize with free product, uh, to get reviews, especially if it says for five star reviews, you will get delisted and shut right. down, and yep. your your seller privileges will be removed. Yep. So don't do that. Um, that was a quick learning lesson right off the bat: is don't do that. Right. And we had to remove ninety thousand pieces of inventory, repackage them, and start sending them into brand new accounts. And at that time, the limit was five thousand. Now it would be even worse yeah. because oh, you only have two hundred yeah. units per per SKU, yeah. which would make it very hard because some of those units were selling like two three hundred units a day. So some of those SKUs wow. were really popular. So we would have been really, really struggling to stay in stock. Um, but we were able to send that in. And from April, 2013, basically at zero again, we got to the $500,000 mark on just that one account uh, by December because we we're really, we, we learned really quickly how to, how to get back on track. Yeah, <laughs> so it was, uh, it was an interesting learning experience. And that basically um, rolled into uh, a training program for sourcing from China, which was called Sourcing uh, sourcing profits, which I did with Paul and another man named uh, Goer Chaudhry from Canada. He's a he's a Toronto guy, I believe. I think he's still in Toronto. Anyway, he's uh he's he's very good at the uh, the idea of like the the affiliate and and, and mass marketing of mm -hmm. stuff. So he, he was like, I want to learn about private labels. So when we did it all together, that was kind of how he came into the mix, and we we did that. And that's when I kind of got introduced to the coaching part because we did this training program and it did quite well for, we only did it for like about nine months and it did over seven figures in nine months. So it was, it did really well, but right. at the same time, I wasn't making like a big chunk of that seven figures, right? I was just doing the legwork yeah. for that stuff. So I was like, all right, I think it's time to kind of break off because I kind of want to go a separate way. You guys are going this way. So now that's when Kirsty and I literally, I stopped working with Paul and stopped doing that. And then two weeks later, that's when Paul and I actually met Kirsty for the first time. And then we started kind of working on more coaching stuff. And pretty much since there, I started my own brands. I actually got two brands now. And and we've been coaching for almost almost five years now. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Now, okay, so to the question of coaching, what um is there some area that you guys tend to obviously, okay, you specialize in Amazon sellers, but um, what would you say is your guys' bread and butter? I think we each got our own, but, uh, you know, uh, Kirsty obviously brings her background of corporate marketing and branding. And that's, that's the crux of everything we do. And I'll let you explain it, Kirsty, but I just wanted to kind of preface this by saying the one little kind of dirty secret about Amazon back in the day of like 2013 through 2016 was all the biggest sellers were only talking about creating products and, and product selection, but all of them had brands, brands. that they incorporated around complementary products right. that actually grew. And when they were trying to like, like recite the training to, in their mind, they were skipping the branding part. And that's when we really, uh, when, when Kirsty and I got together, it was just inherent. Like we knew that you had to create brands, but it didn't seem very obvious to people who were just starting out. And that's kind of where we started kind of 
helping people first. Yeah. So we, we, uh, my wife and I, that's how we managed our stuff. We had three Amazon seller accounts in vitamins, beauty, food, outdoors. We didn't have any kind of vertical and it was, we started selling in 2010 with vitamins and you guys still do vitamins. We though. still do vitamins. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because it's, it's a 10 year old account and it's, we don't even advertising on, do any advertising on that one. It just sells. Uh, because of, but it sells because of a well-known brand mm -hmm. and it's, yep. that's a wholesale account. We, yeah. we have, and we get all this stuff on, um, consignment from the manufacturer and then we pay them as it sells. So that was our model back in the beginning when we started selling, but yes, to your point, hundred percent, like it, you got it, you got to do a brand and do your products underneath that brand because I, gosh, I've forgotten even how many different types of products we have. And it is not workable because you spend all your time being busy, not making money. Right. <laughs> you can't really get repeat buyers in completely different industries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and also, um, you know, one, I think inherently we just kind of brought this to the business, but we didn't realize that a lot of people didn't think that way, as, as you said, Isaac. Um, but we were always thinking ahead, right? So rather than just what am I doing today, which of course you do need to do, but you need a goal to aim for, to then be able to go, what does that mean for what I need to do today? And so one key thing that number one, that's the brand as well, right? Because if you've got all these different products going on, then how do you know what you're going to focus on that day? Right. Right. Um, <laughs> how do I know who I'm talking to? I've got to, I've got to learn all about this type of customer over here to really, you know, get the conversion rate up on Amazon. You need to really understand the, the customer and how they're going to actually connect with you and your brand and buy you over everyone else. Yeah. You know, everyone's always saying, how do I differentiate on Amazon? I need to put this whiz bang thing into the product or I need to completely redesign the product or I need to do all these, you know, things that add cost, add time and everything else into the process. When really, if you really just differentiate on the customer and you really connect with the person who's most likely to buy the product and your brand, then you, that's how you differentiate and mm -hmm. just that doesn't cost you any money it just costs you a bit more time to research the customer etc so the more deeper you can get on understanding your customer right up front then the long-term longevity of the business and your time your energy and all that other stuff is is just going to be leveraged as you actually start to grow the business so it feels like there's a lot more work to be done up front Totally but once you get into it. the groove of that, you become the expert to the customer. Yeah. Okay, well, let's 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 take that as an example then, or let's use that and kind of build on it. So let's say you have someone, now obviously I don't want you guys to give away all your secrets, so I'm sure you have a bunch of things you I do. reserve. <laughs> we have we'll, no secrets. Yeah, we'll take all of your yeah. secrets if you want <laughs> to, but um, if, okay, we're talking about really getting to know your customer. Let's say you've got someone and they've got a good product, they have good potential for a brand. What would you suggest them? What would you say is a good tip to actually start to really get to know your customers. Yeah, so we actually have a process um, and it's called brand positioning, right? So um, we have, we've, we've kind of simplified it as much as possible, but we have a brand positioning statement, a BPS. And literally the first thing you need to think about is who is the most, who is most likely to use my brand of products, right? Mm -hmm. And really kind of think about their attitudes and their behaviors, not necessarily, you know, um, oh, they get up in the morning, they have a cup of coffee, not that kind of thing. Like sure, it's not a customer yeah. avatar. It's like, how do they, what are their current beliefs? What are their current attitudes? Um, and an example that we always use is actually my husband's brand called the Atomic Bear. And he, he really works with survivalists, right? So people that um, are really into survival. So it's kind of like you, the attitudes and us. behaviors. Yeah. Is that you? I, <laughs> I mean, it's so funny. I looked at him and I was thinking, you just look like an Atomic Bear <laughs> <laughs> customer. I, I, I just spent $400 on food just in case things go crazy and it's all in a freezer. So I, I, I feel you. I feel yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. So I'm going to be Googling. So that's what yeah, yeah, so Damon, Atomic if Bear. Atomic you think. <laughs> you know, what, what, what worries you, what scares you, what keeps you up at night, you know, those types of things, that type of um, feeling behind why you even, you're even interested in this space. And that's the kind of, kind of thing that we want to get into. Now, if you don't know that you're not the customer, generally what we find is when we work with people is they are usually their customer. They just don't know it. So that's what they usually pretend we do. To, to pre they pretend that there's something else. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're trying to 
intellectualize everything mm. rather than actually thinking, how do I feel about this? Mm. How do yeah. I feel about using this? Yeah. And so, um, you know, we have a, we have an exercise that we go through and you say, why would you most likely use your product? Actually, Isaac, you might want to go through this because you go through this a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it really comes down to solving the problem that the customers want, right? So anything that they're buying on Amazon, it's to solve a problem that they currently have. That's what products do. They solve problems, whether anybody wants to believe it or not. Like I sell an ice scraper. It solves the problem of scraping ice off your windshield. Sure. Yeah. People are like, well, there's no problems that ice scraper. I'm not talking about world peace. I'm talking about the initial yeah. function of the product is to solve that problem. Right. So a lot of people just say, oh, I don't have, I don't have a product that, that solves the problem. Like every single product solves, solves a right. problem. So it's either an emotional problem or, or like a physical problem and, or even like just the time or whatever. There's lots of different problems that it could solve, but yep. you, you ask yourselves like, you know, who's most likely to use the product. So first and, and stress the use because it's not who's most likely to buy the product because on Amazon, everyone wants to assume that all their products are giftable. Hey, it's great to buy as a gift for a bachelor party, a, a baby shower, a Christmas. I'm like, there's no way every product can be used for every single occasion as a gift. It's just not possible. So stop trying keyword stuff about like, gifts. Oh. However, the person who's actually gifting something is actually giving it to the person who's going to use it anyway. Right. So just talk about the use of it, right? And then you become the authority on the person who's actually the ideal client, who's the person who's buying it for anyway. So think about that. So who's most likely to use it? What problems is it solving? What emotional, you know, uh, feeling do they get when they're not having that problem solved? So, you know, maybe they don't have an ice scraper. Okay. So they're out there scraping a, a windshield with a credit card, right? That that's going to take forever <laughs> and it's probably going to ruin the credit card. So that's, yeah. that's frustrating. Right. So talk about that. Or, you know, then the other thing is how do they feel when they actually use the product that that's fit for the problem and solves right. that problem? That's another thing you can talk about in the listing and that's great marketing. Then you can talk about, you know, how you compare, you don't have to specifically compare yourself to other competitors, but you can say this design is new because of this thing that helps you do this. So like, for example, this ergonomic grip makes it easier to hold this thing and it won't slip out of your hand. Right. So that's a benefit of that feature. So you don't lead with the feature, you lead with the benefit and then talk about the feature. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can actually do this. And we do have a full exercise. And obviously if we went over that, it'd probably take, take up the, the whole entire, call, but yeah. there is a full yeah. exercise to really break down your brand and then each product within that brand to really focus on exactly that. So like mm -hmm. each product doesn't have to fit like every aspect of what you might consider your brand to be, but it's got to fit within that wheelhouse, right? So like I'm, I do automotive accessories for people who are fanatical about their cars. Sure. And so that's kind of how I talk about my ice scraper for people who are fanatical about my cars. That's but I could kind of stray off of that a little bit if I wanted to, but I'm not going to, because that fits my brand so well. And there's people who buy that as stocking stuffers and, you know, moms who mm -hmm. aren't, they don't care about their, their, you know, their automobile as much as like my fanatics do, right. but those people buy it because I'm now the authority of ice scrapers. And, and just how many of those in Nevada? They don't, they don't care. Yeah. So really getting into the head of the, the, the feeling that the customer has and then the problems that that customer has. And then we kind of then go, go into, well, why is your brand different? And so we have this um, area where you've got to think about what are the reasons to believe? Why should the customer believe you mm -hmm. over everyone else? Right. And we like to kind of just na narrow that down, nail that down to like three core reasons. So it could be things like, you know, you understand the customer way more than everyone else because you are the customer. And we, you know, put our heart and soul into developing these products because we use them ourselves. We test them ourselves, all that other stuff. Now it doesn't mean to say that you have to put that in your listings and everywhere you know, on your website, but what that allows you to do is actually really connect with you as the brand owner, the brand sure. developer to the customer, and then how you can feel like you're actually helping them solve the problem. And it helps you really kind of feel that you're making a difference in their lives as well. So uh, we kind of go through that process, get people really clear on who they're talking to, why you are different as a brand, not necessarily the product, but the brand itself. And then once you've got that brand down, it's about, as Isaac said, you know, finding products underneath that brand that that customer will want to continue to buy. And so we actually like people to go quite broad here. It might feel like you're niching, niching, niching down mm -hmm. because one thing we don't want to do is just like make, you know, make the, um, yeah, <clears throat> you know, you, you've got, got pain relief products only. That's yeah, exactly. Too yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's why we want to go on the attitudes and beliefs 
not necessarily a specific okay. product route. That's really smart. Now, sorry, we have a technical thing, so the audience won't see this, but. All right, everyone re re resume their positions. Yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> and we're back. Sorry, there was a, a Zoom technical difficulty, but we are back here. So, okay, so the, it's really it's really interesting talking about the point of like really getting to know your audience, and those are some really good action items to really evaluate r like the points of a listing. And I guess you guys probably do the same thing for people who are like, actually, you know, I am not the buyer at all. I sell women's makeup and you know, it's some 60 year old dude. So do you, is the process the same or how do you alter it in those kind of circumstances? Yeah, it's exactly the same. Absolutely. Exactly the same. Um, that person might have a different connection. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, what we, what we tend to find is, is that a lot of guys that sell products for women is they think women are the same from 18 to 60 mm. and usually they say oh yeah I, I have products from 18 to 60 and I, for women 18 to 60 I'm like yeah a woman is very different from when they're 18 well, to when they're 60. Now hold on a oh second boy, hold when, on. when a man is talking to a woman they're they're oh boy they're Jesus. 18 all the way to 60. Oh, okay, good. That was that was not. So that's bad. probably why. That was well done. Okay, yeah, fine. Yeah. That was a compliment <laughs> to all women, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> we have to be careful if I start yapping. Yeah, he'll say some strange, terrible things. Awesome, yeah. great, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> brilliant. Awesome yeah, yeah um, I think I think the idea is that even if you're not the ideal client, you have to find a way to be the ideal client yeah. and understand the ideal client. If you're not using the products, it's probably not the best use of your time because you're probably going to struggle to really compete at a high level. Um, it's just like if a corporation's trying to talk to an individual, right? I mean, it, it's, they can do it. Mm -hmm. It's just that it doesn't come off as, as, as sincere as if it's Genuine, the exact yeah. same type yeah. of person. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, Jessica Alba created the honest company because she couldn't find anything that had chemical free, like all these other things that were free of all these like irritants for her kids. Right. So she just started her own company because she had that issue. Richard Branson started Virgin Airlines because he didn't have, or he got kicked off a flight or he didn't have a good experience on a flight and just said, you know what? I'm going to buy my own airplane. Yeah. This is how I'm going to run it. And it's going to be because of, this is how the client wants it because I am the ideal client. So those are the kinds of things. If you understand it from your own perspective, it's going to come off a lot easier to, uh, you know, to message and to just, you know, appear like that, that, that brand that cares. Cause you are the brand that cares versus, right. yeah. you know, a giant conglomerate. That's probably at, at one point was that brand that you're starting now, but then it got bought up and then got bought up and then got bought up. And now it's just, you know, part of a corporate hub right. or, you know, cog in the wheel kind of thing that doesn't have that same feeling anymore. Yeah. And you lose that connectivity and they pay yeah. millions of dollars to try and make that connectivity falsely. So exactly. I guess it's a good point. Like never let that disappear. I think it's, I think it's one of the most interesting things because um, Kirsty, kind of like you, I came from marketing uh, through a number of things and found my way into Amazon. But um, branding out there is the king because if you can't connect to your customers, you can't you, you can't connect to your customers. They won't buy you. Um, Amazon's a little different because it's you know you've got all these customers coming to one location, and Amazon can just put ads right in front of you. But at the end of the day. Um, especially as Amazon continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes more and more like a business that needs and applies the same rules that any other business would. You need to have branding. You need yeah. to actually be able to connect with your audience. Those things become hugely important. Um, okay, yeah. So, and one of the, ahead. sorry, just one of the added benefits, if you like, is yeah, the fact that it makes it a lot easier. I think as uh, Damien was kind of alluding to, for, for you as the as the business owner to just focus on one area, right? Mm. So that's like an added benefit. Um, also, you're building an asset that probably someone wants to buy one day. So generally, we found that, you know, we've, there's definitely a lot more roll-ups in the marketplace, um, especially, you know, they're getting a lot more funding and they want to buy brands, right? They don't want to buy a business that's mm. got like a product over here, product over here and a product over here. It's a lot harder for them to integrate it into, into their systems. So you're building a long-term asset with a real brand. And then it also gives you access to other channels that you might want to go into as well. It's a lot easier to, to go into those channels in the future. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In addition to that, one thing that I've run across is that you can often find manufacturers that do products along your line and that, that focuses your communications yeah. to the same single terminal 
as opposed to <laughs> having one person that makes beef sticks and one person that makes vitamins. These are all products we've done. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds very personally yeah. stated. Yeah, that Virginia, Virginia. Well, that's um, interesting. Yeah, interesting you should say that because that's literally, I've only ever worked with one manufacturer in my business. Oh, um, wow. And I've actually done a, a business venture with them mm. in China where we sell on the Chinese Amazon, which is Tmall, um, as a partnership. So not only do I work with them consistently with pretty much all my products apart from one um we get great pricing we have built a massive relationship over the last seven years and we've also got a business partnership together as That's well great. so yeah it definitely has way bigger benefits yeah yep yeah me I, I i try not to do this anymore and my wife will slap my hands because she knows i'm basically lying right now but I try. That's why to we don't have her in the room and him <laughs> in the room at the same time. <laughs> I, tr I try not to find a product to sell that I personally want right then and there. So, you know, because I, I am an impulse buyer. I'm like, what can I use it for? It doesn't matter. I want it, you know. <laughs> uh, and I would do the same things. I would bring all kinds of things to the table that are like, Oh, we need to sell these stuffed animals. They're awesome. Like, we don't have a baby brand. Like, just, we'll just do another <laughs> Amazon account. It'll be fine. Like, no, babe, knock it off. Stop. Get up. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, this that's the thing about Amazon. This, Well, business in general, there's so much opportunity. Mm. One of our core things as a business owner is actually to figure out what's the biggest opportunities that are actually going to get us to the money that we want to make. And that's one key area that we all, the, we also focus on as well, probably mostly in uh, coaching, because if you, you, you know, like I said, you've got so much opportunity, you could be launching products left, right, and center. Um, you think, yeah, this is an awesome product. Number one, you're going to run out of money very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. You're also mm -hmm. going to lose a lot of focus. And then you're also not going to know exactly what the key levers are that are actually moving your business forward. Yeah. And usually when we work with people, they've got to that point where they've had some success, but they've kind of lost their way. Like they're just confused about what they should be doing mm -hmm. every day. Um, they've got so much opportunity and limited funds. And then all of a sudden, all of their cash is tied up in inventory and they're like, I'm not getting any sales. And mm -hmm. so I'm screwed. So yeah. that's, and to, to that's usually where that. we kind of end up working with people. Yeah. And to build on that, don't go get a product that's too expensive, which was my latest mistake. Mm. My, my latest products were over $40 a piece. So, you know, yep. that that's an awful lot of money. Yeah, it burns through some cash. And so so you, you could either spend all your money diversifying in a whole bunch of little or lesser expensive products or be the one guy that chooses the one product that eliminates your ca cash flow like that, you know, because it's yeah. and then it's an, and it could be an untested product even. You know, yeah. So, yeah, and we actually, we actually, one of our biggest areas, I think that I've never seen anybody incorporate into their business. And this is a little secret, I guess, behind the, 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 the fact that there is a lot of different ways that you can find products, but the number one thing that's going to stop you from getting the products that you want is the budget. Mm -hmm. And if your budget can allow you to be successful. So think about this. It's like, it's not just about the cost of goods, but it's also about the marketing behind it, how to get launch and visibility, how to do the ongoing ads, thinking about the reorders. If you can't afford all that up front, then you should not launch the product because right. if you don't understand that there's competitiveness to getting on Amazon and selling on Amazon, then you're just going to keep sitting at that point where 90% of your sales come from ads, which means you're never profitable yep. or you're just never even going to get sales, which means you just wasted all that money on that order. Right. Yep. So we need you to understand that in order to be successful, you have to do, you know, X, Y, Z's type of type of strategies. And then you have to plan the budget for all those things ahead of time before you even order the product. And if you do that and you say, okay, I've got $15,000 or $10,000. And if all that stuff falls under that or within that kind of range, then you're okay. You can move forward. At least you got an idea that your products aren't going to be so drastically different once you do the research that you, you know, you, you, you did the research and it says it's $12,000 and all of a sudden it's 30,000. There's, there's generally never going to be that. Right. It might be like 15,000 instead of 10 or 12, but you're kind of in the ballpark and it's not like you're t totally out of money. It's just that you were comfortable, more comfortable at 10 or 12 than 15, for example. Sure. So yeah, the exact same thing happened to us before. I mean, we've launched too many products at one time. We've launched expensive products that, that didn't work. And it's like, you need to know how much cash flow is going to be there, not just today, yeah. but then three months from now and six months and nine months and 12 months. So that way you can continually launch products that will impactfully 
grow your bottom line of, of profit and then also revenue of course, of course, but profit more than anything in income. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I've definitely made that mistake. So then, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, some of these have varying application depending on where you're at as a seller. What are some things that you see as maybe a common theme with someone who is selling well on Amazon and they're really looking, they're like, okay, maybe it's their, like you said, they're missing that direction or the, like, what are some of these common commonalities that you see with sellers who are veterans and they need help? Yeah. They usually don't have any money. So generally the, the problem is that they don't understand their numbers. Mm. So they're getting all these awesome sales that they believe is profitable because what they've probably done in the first place, as Isaac said, they probably just looked at their profit margin and it stops there, which mm -hmm. really they've looked at the cost of goods and they've looked at the FBA fees, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But they haven't looked at all the on costs of advertising. How much is your PPC going to cost you on your main keyword to actually keep you on page one? Right. Where are all the sales coming from? Are they coming from that keyword, that keyword, that keyword? Or are they coming from like, 20 of them mm -hmm. and so they haven't got into that level of detail before they've launched a product so they've probably had maybe some success they're starting to get some cash back so they go whoa I'm, this is easy awesome i'm gonna launch 10 mm -hmm. and i'm gonna do it all in the next six months are you using and so they go out to their supplier example by yeah, the way you yeah are you are you using our account <laughs> yeah. have we spoken before and she's <laughs> like yeah i'm looking at your account <laughs> right now <laughs> We know our ideal client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's what happens. And unlike, as Isaac said, cause we've done it as well. Right. So mm -hmm. that's why we can, we can coach people. Cause we're like, Oh, you know, bugger, we've done that as yeah. well. Um, but essentially what, what it means is, is that what we do first up, regardless of if you've even started a business before, or you've been selling for years is we do an audit to make sure that you actually understand where the core leaks are in your business. Okay. That could be even just as simple as your conversion rates are like less than 20%, right? If your conversion rate is less than 20% and you feel like you're spending all your money on ads, but you're not making any money back, it's either because you haven't got enough profit in your products or your conversion rate is not high enough. Mm -hmm. And so you're sending a bunch of traffic to a listing that's never going to convert, right. right? So that's number one. So we look at the profit margins, the return on investment, the ad costs, um, to even determine, should you even bother with this product? And usually what we have to do is, is to kind of get people over the grief of kind of getting rid of some products first, because they're <laughs> just like, Dead they're weight. just leaking money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, or we then work with them on, okay, this is a better range of products for your, um, for your business moving forward. We've worked with people, even my husband, when I met him, he was doing a t totally different brand, had great sales, but he was in the, um, the cell phone accessories niche mm. had great top line sales, but wasn't getting the money back out of his business. And yeah. so he went, right, I'm just going to ditch all that. I'm going to go for this brand where I know I can connect with the customer and um, really focus on profit and return on investment. And now his business is completely flying. So awesome. generally what it is, it's the numbers part that people just don't understand. Yeah. Well, numbers, but then again, just there, you brought it back to the, I guess, branding, but also how 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 much do you find that it's someone selling something that they personally believe in? I think when they first come to us, it's like 50-50, wow. if, if that. It's usually less than that. But um, after afterwards of working with us, we try to get everybody 100% because most people will just be like, I'm going to sell on dogs because, you know, dog products because I think it's a very good niche. And it's yeah. like, do you own a dog? No. They're like, no, and I don't when even was like the last dogs. Time you, I'm, allergic I've never dogs. I'm allergic to dogs. I'm yeah, I'm allergic person. to dogs. Or, okay, I have cats. I'm like, well, then why are you selling dog products? Why don't you sell cat products? Yeah. Oh, because there's more dogs in America as, as being owned. I'm like, there's also a lot of fish being owned too, but that doesn't mean you could go into fish products. I mean, yeah. you got to find something that you're actually passionate about too, because when things get hard, and they will, you're going to want to quit. Yeah. And yeah. if your numbers especially are telling you that you're not making any money, well, you you it's... Uh, I'll equate it to this. So a lot of people say that their first products are their baby, right? If your product's not making you money, it's actually more like a parasite and it's yeah. just sucking the life out of you. So get rid yeah. of it. Like take an antibiotic or something and get rid of that product. Right. So yeah. get it, get an understanding that, you know, just because you came up with the idea and you put the work in does not mean that it was a good idea. Unfortunately, 
and doesn't mean you should continue going down that path just because you work all that time in it. Yeah, I can um, one, one, uh, that. one mentor of mine, one time he said, you don't pay the dentist by how long it takes for him to pull the tooth. You mm -hmm. pay him to remove the tooth as fast as possible. Right. right? So you want this, the pain ripped off. Whereas people are like, well, I think I can get it turned around in the next 12 to 16 months. I'm like, you're going to have a long, painful process here. Yeah, if you actually yeah. try that 12 just to 16 to get months rid of it in the next three months, if you can't just dispose of the product and move on, that's yeah. going to feel a lot better moving forward than it is to, to drag this process mm -hmm. out for our right. listeners. That is key, key advice because yeah. our first product was a miraculous flop and <laughs> it was in cell phone except accessories and we thought we were brilliant and, and we were at the time we were and but it didn't take off and eventually about a uh, kind of year and a half or two years later of that stuff sitting in inventory i was like okay and threw it in the dumpster i was like ah oh, yeah it's like better. a weight off yes. weight off yeah, yeah. Totally, yeah it's totally. totally like a weight off You're like good that crap is done done and i did it again with another one of our products it was like must be twelve, fifteen thousand dollars in in value, you know, but we weren't selling it, and I was like, okay, we're done. We're not going to sell this. We're not going to pick this brand back up. Into the dumpster it goes. Yeah, it was potentially a lot of money, but you know, I already spent the in that money previously over a year ago. I was like, okay, done. Yeah. It's yeah. on to the next thing. Yeah, the checks cashed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. and you can you can spend like you just said, it's a weight off your shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could spend more money obviously but more time worrying about that thing whereas you know what i'm just going to cut it out right and yeah. we actually worked with with a, with someone one of my friends actually and she did the classic variations right so this is mm -hmm. another thing that we see a lot of people come to us and they're like i've got all these products though oh yeah i've got all these products under this brand okay you have a look at it we've got one product 10, 10 different variations, variations. Yeah. different colors different sizes basically things that don't matter to the customer. Right. Maybe they've had a customer that said, oh, this would be lovely in blue. Oh, oh, we'll get a blue one in. And usually what we do is we look at the, all the variations and go, which one has got a reason for being? Mm -hmm. And all the others, get rid of them. Yeah. And they're like, freak out. <laughs> right? mm. But because you've got all those variations on the listing, what happens is, is the customer goes to the listing, doesn't really know which one they right. want yeah. and will usually leave. Yeah. Um, and we've tested kind of this time yeah. and time and time and time again. And so when you actually look at the, the one thing you should do is if you've got a bunch of variations and you're listening to this, just go and have a look at the sales of all your different variations and just pick the top one. And I, I will bet you there's probably either one or two that are giving you hundred percent of the sales, right. right? Everything else is like bits and bobs yeah. and get rid of them. So we had a, our friend, she was, did she have 30 variations on one skew? I think it was like 40 oh. of the yeah. same thing. It was like six <laughs> colors and four sizes. It was or five 30 sizes. seconds yeah. cycle through. She was making yeah. 10 sales a day with 40 variations, right? And so we were like, all right, mate, you just got to get, I think we left her with two because yeah. it made sense. And we were like, okay, you got to get rid of them. She's like, I can't do it. I can't do it. You got to get rid of it. Just get rid of it. And so she was like, all right. And she did it. And she was like, oh my God, why didn't I do that 12 months ago? Yeah. Right. I feel so much better. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then her sales skyrocketed because her conversion rate went from like 15% yes. to 53% or something like right. that. And then yeah. her sales actually went up in the, in the next month. So that yeah, it was total sense. Very easy wow. fix. Yeah. And, 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 and I do want to mention this because I know, I guarantee you there's going to be people sitting on this podcast, listening to this going, ah, bull crap, variations work. <laughs> and sometimes they do, but it, listen to what Kirsty said when she said, there's a reason for the variation. Yes. For example, yeah. a flavor of coffee. There's probably a reason for that. People have a preference for flavor of coffee. Mm -hmm. People don't have a preference for black, you know, silicone spatula versus blue silicone spatula. They'll just buy the most popular one, whatever right. comes up first. Mm -hmm. That's the one that they see. That's the one they clicked on. So why wouldn't they just buy that one? Yep. Whereas, you know, some things, yeah, like flavor or potentially size, size actually is a reason. So like I sell some gloves, you know, you have to have different sizes or else people are going to complain about the size not fitting. Yeah. But in, in, in essence, you don't want to have too many of them and you don't want to have color variations for no reason. Cause that's right. the biggest mistake people make is well, I'll just do a color or a design. And it's like, well, the design is actually the, the function is the same. So why are you changing the design? That's kind of admitting that your first design is not as good as the second one or vice versa. So doing these things actually lowers your conversion rate. And in the end, it actually messes things up. So I'll give you two big examples of, of people, big, big, successful, um, you know, uh, famous people that have said, don't do variations, essentially Tim Ferriss. He says mm. in his book, uh, the four hour work week, he basically says, 
if you give too many people too many choices, then they suffer from the choice of indecision yes. and yeah. they won't buy anything. They'll act, and, and, and this is funny because I actually knew that before I read the book and I read the book and I'm like, this is exactly right. Like we see it all the time. Right. And then Steve Jobs, when he got back from uh, back into Apple, Apple had over 200 products and Steve oh, Jobs wow. going like, what are we doing here? Why are we looking at all these products? And he, and he goes, show me what's making the money. And they're like, these 10 products. He's like, all right, get rid of everything else. Wow. And they're just like, you mean get rid of 190 like, products? Uh, and they're like, and he's like, absolutely. <laughs> and now Apple is like, what, one or two on the on the most successful, like yeah. biggest corporations on earth yeah. now? Yeah. Yep. So it works. You're focusing on the wrong things. It's not about sales. It's about impact to your business growth. If you can impact your business growth by, hey, instead of launching five more variations, go launch five products in different areas. That will be five times more impactful than these five variations. Right. I'd almost guarantee it every day of the week. Yep. And that also circles straight back to building a brand mm -hmm. and not yep. shotgun, you know, shotgun blast of products. Like yep. I did. Yep. <laughs> like yeah. you did. <laughs> I think people just get impatient, right? They, they, they see all these big sellers out there, mm -hmm. you know, basically saying, hey, I'm an eight figure seller. I'm a nine figure seller. I'm a seven figure seller, whatever. And so you feel like you need to be there mm -hmm. when really that's the other key thing that we focus on is what's, what do you want, right? You're mm -hmm. starting a business. How much money do you want to make from this business that will help you achieve the lifestyle that you want yeah. and start there, right? And we, we work with smart goals. So specific, measurable, right. so you can actually measure the thing, attainable, yeah. because yeah, you're going to set a vision, which is totally different, right? A vision is where do you want to be in, you know, five, 10 years? Whereas this is about what do I want next year? Right. Um, relevant. So is it relevant to you? There's no point in building a business where you need VC capital and all this other stuff if you actually really don't want to do that, right? right. Yeah. And then time bound, when are you actually going to achieve it? Mm -hmm. And usually we find setting these goals is usually, you know, at least 12 months, right? Because you can kind of taste it, but it's far enough away to be able to put the steps in place to be able to do it. Right. And so by by setting the income goal first, how much money you want to make, we then work up from the income. So say it's $5,000. Um, we just as a rule of thumb, we just try and make it easy for people. So we say, okay, you want to make $5,000 income, like literally, I want to take that on, I want to put it in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So you need to make profit to be able to do that. Right. Now profit is not income. Mm -hmm. Profit, right. we need to take some of that profit to grow the business. So we would say take half of it, take half the profit, reinvest it back in the business, and take half for yourself, just right. as a rule of thumb. So therefore, if you want five five thousand income, you want ten thousand dollars profit, right. and then ideally we want to be operating net profit after all expenses at twenty percent. So then work up from there. So if I need that twenty percent profit, I need to be doing fifty thousand dollars in income. Uh, sorry, in revenue right. in my sales, and then you can say, okay, now I'm going to look for the products that are actually going to hit those numbers. Right. And so you, that's all literally what you do. You just totally impassionate about the products get passionate about the brand that you're building and the customer that you want to serve mm -hmm. and totally dispassionate about the types of products that are going to serve the customer yep. and then okay. you find the products based mm -hmm. on the income that you want to make right. and so yeah, that's what we yeah. really focus on yeah what do yeah you i think everybody have? wants to sell those sexy products but if i sold bolts and screws and i got fifty thousand dollars a month from bolts and screws and whatever you know wing nuts i'm cool with that right if it's my brand my, my customers are looking for them. They need them. Why wouldn't you want to sell stuff like that? Mm -hmm. But people are like, oh, that's not fun to sell. Like, well, do you like the brand? Yes. Okay. You got the brand. Does your customers need this from a brand like yours? Yes. Then what's the problem? Like right. sell the products. You don't have to be super passionate. Now, again, people will say, well, how do you get passionate about an ice scraper? I don't, I don't say that I'm necessarily passionate about the ice scraper, but I am passionate about the brand. So it reflects it in the listing. So sure. you got to have some passion around the messaging, but that's an easy thing to do. Like, you talk to them like you want to be talked to like, Hey, here's the reasons why you're using these bolts and nuts versus those ones over there or whatever. This is why it's easier to, to drill these ones in versus those. And as long as you understand that that from a customer perspective is important, then the products kind of just fall into place. As long as you're not so hung up on what you sell as, as, as much as how you sell them and who you're selling them to. That's right. really the important parts there. Makes sense. Well, cool. Well, okay. So here's, and I think, I think I covered this with you guys, but yes, I did. Okay. So the way we kind of do this is we have the majority of the episode for the general audience, meaning managed by stats users, non-managed by stats users, doesn't matter, right? Um, but then what we'll do is we'll do a little break, which will occur in roughly 
30 to 45 seconds. And <laughs> everything after that will be specifically for managed by stats users. So we'll kind of just wrap up the podcast here, sort of, and then just basically have a mini episode for everyone else. So basically, if you are a managed by stats user, make sure to jump onto our Facebook group so you can get the rest of the content. Um, and if you're not, you know, consider Sorry. becoming a managed by stats user. <laughs> yeah. And we'll put the link to that down in the, in description, the description of this video. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and so then for anyone who is watching this, make sure to, you know, depending on the platform you're saying of YouTube, like it, subscribe. And in addition to subscribing, because if we're being honest, subscribes literally mean absolutely nothing. It's sort of, yeah, just like a pat personally. on the back, but, but it doesn't mean anything for you. <laughs> if you actually want to know that we have another episode coming, you need to hit the little bell icon and then switch it to all. So you actually get notified when we release something yep. because, you know, I I this, the, the value you guys just provided here is amazing for so you charge other people money for this. Yeah. Probably yeah. Lots of money <laughs> <for this. laughs> um, and so I if it's on other platforms, give it a, you know, thumbs up, give it a five star review, because unlike Amazon, we are still allowed to ask specifically for a five star review. If you have uh, some reason a four star or lesser, yeah, don't even bother. We don't actually want those. You, you don't need to do those. We'll take <laughs> only five star reviews. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't feel it was five stars, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks you, for watching. You can go now. <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't like this and you're on YouTube, hit the thumbs down button twice. That'll, yeah. that'll also help us. <laughs> we know really that you don't like it. No, just kidding. Otherwise, uh, you know, we'll have another episode out here in another uh, week. Maybe we're actually looking at going to two episodes a week, so that's going to be fun. Mm -hmm. But um, otherwise, if you're a Managed by Stats user, jump over to the Facebook page, and we will see you guys there. Thank you guys so very much for providing such amazing value, and we will see you here in a second over on Facebook. Kind of confusingly stated, but it works. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks, guys. Take care.